In this video, you'll get an introduction to inverse functions. Functions f and g are inverses if f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. So hopefully you recall from previous lessons that f of g of x is normally not equal to g of f of x. But anytime g and f are inverse functions, when you compose the two functions, you get x. And that has to happen for all values of x in the domain of g and f, respectively. A function has an inverse if and only if it is one to one. So if your function is one to one, you're guaranteed that there is an inverse in existence. We use the notation f and then a superscript negative one and then parentheses x, and we read it as f inverse x. So this is not f to the negative first power. This is the notation we're using for f inverse of x. The domain of f is the range of f inverse. And the range of f is the domain of f inverse. This will be very important, and so you want to remember that. What that means is that if you have some ordered pair AB that satisfies f of x, then the ordered pair BA would satisfy f inverse of x. So basically, the x and y values switch. And we'll see some neat properties of this um, having to do with a function, the graph of a function and the graph of its inverse. But we'll see that in another video. But anytime you're doing an inverse, you switch the x and y values. The domain becomes the range of the inverse and the range of f becomes the domain of the inverse. Let's determine if the function defined by the set of ordered pairs has an inverse. And if it does, let's find the inverse. So what I wanna do is I'll do a quick check that it is a function. So I look at my x values, three, one, two, four, and there's no repeated x values, no repeated x values. So that tells me immediately that I do have a function because each x only maps to one y. And then I look at the y values, one, six, three, and zero, and there's no repeated y values. That tells me that the function is one to one. So no repeated y values tells me that I have a one to one correspondence. All right, so because it's one to one, that tells me that an inverse exists. And to find the inverse, I'm going to switch the x and y values. Mm -hmm. So for the inverse, I'll list it as a set of ordered pairs, just like I um, see for the actual defined function. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put my set brackets. And what I'm gonna do is switch the x's and y's. So I have the point 3, 1 in my function, so I'm going to have the point 1, 3 on the inverse. In my original function, I have the point 1, 6, so that would switch to the point 6, 1. The point 2, 3 would switch to the point 3, 2. 
and the point four zero would switch to the point zero four. So to find the inverse, you're going to switch the X and Y values. And another way to think of this is that the domain of F or your original function becomes the range of your inverse and the range or Y values of your original become the domain of your inverse. All right, so using this idea of switching the X and Y values, if a function H has an inverse and H inverse of one equals zero, let's find H of zero. So this means that on H inverse of X, the ordered pair, or there is the ordered pair one, zero, because H inverse of one equals zero. So that would be my input, zero would be my output. So because of this and the fact that I switch the domain and range, this would tell me that on H of X, there is the ordered pair zero, one, because I switch the X and Y values. So one, zero on the inverse would translate to zero, one on the original function. So basically H of zero, this is telling me H of zero has to equal one. We just switch the X and the Y values. All right, in this last example, we want to determine if the functions f of x equals 3x plus 2 and g of x equals x minus 2 over 3 are inverses, inverses of each other. And so what we want to do is we want to use that rule that if they're inverses, then f of g of x has to equal x and g of f of x also has to equal x. So I'll go ahead and plug in g of x into my f function. So I'm gonna get three times g of x plus two, and g of x is x minus two over three. So I'm gonna get three times x minus two over three plus two. I'll go ahead and put the x minus two over three in parentheses. Now I have three in the numerator and in the denominator. So those threes are going to cancel each other out. So I end up with x minus two plus two, which just gives me an x. So we're looking good so far. Now I wanna do the same thing with g of f of x. So g is x minus two over three. Instead of the x, I'm gonna write f of x. So I'll have f of x minus two divided by three. f of x is the function three x plus two. So I have three x plus two minus two in the numerator and my three in the denominator. Two minus two is zero, so I get three X over three, which is X. Okay, so because F of G of X and G of F of X both equal X, so 
since f of g of x equals x, and remember this has to be an and, g of f of x equals x, we know that f and g are inverses of each other. f of x and g of x are inverses. And you can think of this as their functions that basically undo one another when you compose them. When you take the composition of two inverses, you get the original input as your result. x in this case is our original input. But this is how you check whether or not two functions are inverses. And I wrote that wrong, I see now. This should not say zero. This should say x. f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. So that's really important. They both have to equal x in order for the two functions to be inverses.